Uh, tonight we are in part three of a series, <clears throat> and this series is called Letters for Leaders. And the four letters we're studying in this series were written by the Apostle Paul, probably while he was in prison toward the end of his ministry. We're not sure on one letter in particular, but we think most of them, if not all of them, were written while he was in prison toward the end of his ministry. And these are unique among all his writings. He writes to churches and he gives instructions to churches, but these are unique because they're personal letters. They're addressed to individuals, individuals in particular who are in leadership roles. And we've already talked about Philemon. He led a, a church that met in his house. But uh, now we're talking about Titus, another young man that Paul directly mentored. And, and Paul's very free with his words to Titus and to Timothy in particular because he's mentored them. And he just talks about leadership very, very transparently. And, and so that's why we're studying these is because all of us are leaders in some fashion or form in the church, whether we're a pastor or whether we're a department leader, uh, but even if we're just leading uh, somebody else in a home Bible study, we're being an example to somebody else. There's great principles here. And, and so uh, Timothy, he lives in Ephesus, and he's a pastor there. That's a metropolitan city. But Titus lives on the island of Crete, and it's a wicked, wicked place. Uh, they don't say very good things about Crete. In fact, they made a verb out of the word Crete and said, if you Crete, you're lying. So to Crete was to lie. So it's not a very good place. And yet uh, Paul leaves Titus there and he says, appoint elders and build the church and, and it's going to be fine. You can do this. And so that's the book that we're studying. And Titus has been told in particular to set in order the churches and to ordain elders in every city. And Paul's left him there to do that. And so in the first chapter, um, he gives a list of character qualifications. You probably remember that from last week. All of these qualifications, he's not looking for uh, people with certain competencies. It's good to be able to do something, but he's looking for people with certain character traits because character always trumps competence when we're leading the church of the living God. If you don't have character, it doesn't matter how many skills you have. Uh, you just can't do anything that matters for the kingdom of God. And so in the first chapter, he gives a list of characters, uh, character traits to, to look for when he's appointing leaders. And then at the end of the chapter, he says, and by the way, Titus, you need to deal with all those false teachers that are teaching all this false doctrine and deal with them strongly. And so that's what Titus does. And we pick it up in chapter two tonight. And uh, Paul says, uh, I want you to deal with these false teachers, but for you, I want you to speak the things that become sound doctrine. Titus, I want to talk to you about Christian behavior for leaders because belief that doesn't affect your behavior is absolutely worthless. If you have a belief and it doesn't affect the way you live, that's a worthless belief. And so Paul instructs Titus, he said, I'm going to talk to you about some lifestyle practices. And watch what he says here. These are becoming to sound doctrine. These are attractive. When you look at our doctrine and these behaviors are in your life, these behaviors are becoming to sound doctrine. So literally, if your doctrine is sound, that means healthy. If you've got healthy doctrine, then you're going to have a holy life. If you don't have healthy doctrine, you can live any old way you want. But if you've got healthy doctrine, you're going to have a healthy, holy life. And so, so Paul is, is starting to lay this out for Titus because here's what he knows and this is what we keep coming back to in this series. A good disciple, their job is to make another good disciple. Good disciples make good disciples. Uh, you, you can't really be a disciple of the Lord when he was all concerned about the world and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God was a giver. God loved the world. And so we can't really follow him in discipleship if we're not even concerned about anybody. And, and so he gives different instructions here. Now, this is what's cool because Titus pastors a multi-generational church. So here's what he says. He gives different instructions for different categories of people. Um, now, you can put yourself in whatever category you like. There's aged men. There's aged women. Uh, we won't ask you to admit if you're in those. There's young men. There's young women. There's slaves. Uh, today, our context would be employees. We got a lot of those here tonight. And that's because we face different challenges at different ages and different stages in life. So here's his instructions for a multi-generational church, and this would be his instruction if he was here tonight. 
Here's what we need for people who are going to impact others. They're going to lead others. They're going to be an effective disciple. They're, they're going to be able to mentor and lead and develop other disciples. Number one, aged men. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. The word sober there means somebody that's not extreme. They're not extravagant. They're not excessive. The word grave means, of course, somebody that's serious. It doesn't mean somebody that never smiles or never laughs or is always grumpy or angry. It means somebody that is dignified or honorable or worthy of respect, that they have lived for God long enough that they are worthy of respect. And uh, then we have temperate. And the word temperate there simply means self-controlled. And if you're self-controlled, uh, you will be moderate in your opinion. You're not always flying off the handle with some crazy opinion. You're careful. And so Paul's setting this up. He said, you know, the older men in the church, the elders in the church, this is what we're looking for. This is how you help your church. If you're sober, you're, you're not some extreme, extravagant, excessive person. If you're serious, you're grave, you're, you're worthy of respect. If you're temperate, you're self-controlled. People who look at you for a model, they never have to think, well, if I follow them, I think I'd get in trouble because you're self-controlled. And then he says they need to be sound in faith. Sound, of course, means healthy. They need to have a, a whole faith that affects every area of their life. They need to be uncorrupted in their convictions. So they have to have a faith that, that's, you know, their doctrine does something to their lifestyle. It's not that they believe in the oneness of God and they believe in the new birth and they believe in this and that and the other, but it never affects their lifestyle. They need to be sound in faith. And then they also need to be sound in charity. Uh, charity is love, but it's more than love. It's kindness and it's tenderness and it's uh, being affectionate towards somebody. And they need to be sound in patience. That means they need to be constant in, and, and they need to be cheerful. And they need to, uh, in, in the middle of trials, they need to be cheerful. And they need to be uh, people of endurance, people that have hung on and, and they've gone through the fire and they've been through the battle and they haven't wavered. And so that's the list for aged men. So aged men, you need to be uh, somebody that takes God seriously, I think would sum it up just about right. You need to be somebody that uh, takes church seriously. And, and that's what we're looking for when we look at somebody that's seasoned. Why? Because the eyes of the church are on you, especially the eyes of new people. And then he says, the aged women likewise in a similar way, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women. And then if he begins to list what they should teach the young women. So aged women, it says, you should be in behavior as becometh holiness, a lifestyle that is becoming or suitable or appropriate or attractive to holiness. Um, that, that when people look at you, especially the young ladies that come in the church, that when they look at you, they see a model of how they should live, how they should act, how they should interact, how they should uh, adorn and apparel themselves. They should see that in behavior as becometh holiness. But holiness is not just an outside thing. He says they shouldn't be false accusers. That means a gossip. That means a slanderer. That means somebody that's always going around like a little worm, attaching itself to somebody's ear and saying, have you heard? Oh, maybe that was too blunt for a Wednesday night. The Greek word there for slanderer, you know what the Greek word is? Diablos, devil. So don't let the aged women be devils in the church. That's what it says. That's Bible. In other words, you can cause a whole lot of friction and a whole lot of trouble because as we get older and especially if he's using the word aged in our context as we get older we have a little bit more free time we're not in our prime working years we have a little bit more time to get the news and to spread the news <clears throat> so don't be slanderers don't be gossips don't be false accusers don't be diablos. Don't be devils. And then he says, not given to much wine. Uh, now, we don't typically have a problem with that in our church culture. It literally means in bondage to banqueting. In bondage to banqueting. 
uh, just a frivolous life. And of course, in that day, in the Roman Empire, if somebody was uh, given to much wine, they were a person that was always at parties and they were always, you know, trying to fill up their life with that kind of activity. So he said, don't be in bondage to that stuff. And then he says, be teachers of good things. Be examples in your actions and in your attitudes, good things. Just that's your presentation of your life. And why does he ask the older women to be like that? It's so they can teach. This is very important. So they can teach the young women. Uh, folks, when a, a woman comes into the apostolic church, her lifestyle, if she's going to get this, is going to become drastically different in every way than what the world teaches women to think like, act like, talk like, appear like, and dress like. Her lifestyle is going to be forever changed. She's going to be modest instead of sensual. The world teaches her she needs to look sensual. But the church teaches her she needs to look modest. Her lifestyle, even in the outward, is going to totally change. And so, ladies, if you're an aged sister, and if you're 40 years old but you've been here for 25 years, you're probably an aged sister. You've been around. We need models. That's what this is about. They need to be able to look. Uh, somebody said, well, no, I, I, you know, you just need to follow Jesus. Well, somebody said, I, I want a Jesus with skin on. I want to be able to look at somebody and know that they're following Jesus. And that's exactly what Paul said here. Follow me as I follow Christ. And so he said, we need these models in the older women because then they can teach the younger women. And here's what they should teach the younger women. To be sober to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So that's what the older women are to teach the younger women. Now, we already know what sober means. It, doesn't, it means not extreme or extravagant or excessive because young women can fall into that and wanting, 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 keep up with the Joneses and all that. They should love their husbands, uh, that's a Greek word, philandros. It means to be affectionate or, or fond of somebody. Uh, they should love their children. That's the maternal instinct. The word is uh, philo, uh, philotechnos, and, and that means uh, to be maternally affectionate. So there's affectionate and loving toward your husband. They should be affectionate and loving toward their children. Uh, it, it, it frightens me when I read some of the stuff in the media today about our culture and how parents uh, abuse and abandon their children. Uh, th that scares me. That's not normal or natural, but in a world that's given over to that, and in the Roman Empire, uh, if they had an unwanted child, they just took it outside the city and left it on a hill and walked away. And if the wild animals got it, good. And if somebody else picked it up to abuse it, who cares? It was a deformed child. That was the world into which Christianity came. And Christians from the beginning were different in their families. And if our families aren't any different than any sinful family, any immoral family, any worldly family, then we're doing this wrong. Our families are to be a haven of love and respect and kindness. And, and so young ladies, young uh, mothers and young wives, love your children, love your husbands. Young women are to be discreet. That means disciplined or self-controlled. It's the same root as the word sober. Uh, they are to be chaste. That means innocent and modest and pure and clean from defilement. And, and young women that are here tonight, uh, I know our young people are over there, but you know what? We got some young ladies in here that are moms and wives and single mothers and, and, and single ladies in here. Let me tell you something. The world is always at you to be immodest, to be impure, to be sensual, uh, even the fashions, even the pictures, everything on the internet. You need to just steer clear of that. Uh, you should not be comparing your life to somebody's fictional life on Facebook and getting jealous of that. Most of that's just science fiction. And, and, and what, what you need to keep in mind is that God didn't call you to be like that. He called you to be like him. And so that young women be chaste, they're, they're literally innocent to all of that junk and all that filth in the world. 
Uh, they are to be keepers at home. That, that phrase gets a little bit of controversy sometimes, but it's not a contro controversial phrase. The, the phrase literally means in the Greek language that they should be a guard at home. I love to see a mom that is fiercely protective over what her kids watch and do and their friends and their activities. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. She's doing her job. She's a guard at home. She refuses to let anything come near her kids. Uh, it literally means to be a stayer, that, that she just puts down her roots and like nothing's getting by me. Um, she's busy at home. Uh, it, it means, uh, it has a sense of being domestically inclined, but it's not saying a woman couldn't have a career, couldn't have a job. It just means that her first priority uh, should be her home. Um, that's what it means. Uh, she should be good. That means honest and fair and, and, and worthy and kind. She, sh she should be, uh, you know, uh, she should be a, an open, honest person, not all this subterfuge and hiding things and faking everybody out. Uh, and then obedient to their own husbands. And that means as you would expect it in Scripture. It means to be submitted or to be in subjection to or under the leadership of her own husband. And that is not a put down for women. Christianity exalted women. It was the first religion to do so. And if you look around the world today, it's just about the only religion to do so. Most religions still put down women, even in the 21st century. So when it says obedient to their own husbands, it means submitted or in subjection or obedient to or under the leadership of, and it's simply saying the order of the home. The husband is not to lord it over the wife. He's to love her as Christ loved the church so it doesn't give him permission to be a tyrant. But if she accepts that role, she's an incredible guard of the home. She does something for the home that the husband cannot do. Why do we do this? Why do we need the aged men to do this and the aged women to do this and the young women to be taught this? It's so the word of God be not blasphemed. Our culture disagrees with our Bible doctrine. They hate it. But you know what? The same culture that hates Bible doctrine should be impressed with your biblical lifestyle. They should look at your marriage or your home, your love for your children, and they should walk away impressed. They should kind of walk away saying, I think those people are absolutely nuts. Those people believe weird stuff. They believe in a Savior that died on a cross, and they believe a man got out of the grave, and they believe in divine healing, and they believe in speaking in tongues. They're crazy people, but I'm so impressed with the way they treat each other. That's what they should be saying. And so when a culture disagrees with our doctrine, they should find it attractive the way that we live out our doctrine. Our culture is repelled by our teaching on morality. They don't want to hear it. They're repelled by our teaching on marriage anymore because that's changing and morphing, and they don't want to hear that. But you know what? If they really see a Christian life and if they really see a Christian marriage, they may not want it for themselves, but they will walk away. And I've seen it happen even in our neighborhoods with our families. They walk away being so impressed by how our families and our couples love each other. A Christian family should be the envy of every other home on your street. Your home is to be a model of what the Bible teaches. Christianity is not about showing up for service and putting on the dog for everybody else. Christianity is about living this out day after day after day. And so our homes, they're the front line of our Christian faith. It's not this auditorium, it's our homes. And then when we come here, we come here to get instructed. We come here for fellowship. We come here to get together with other Christians and other Christian homes, and we gain strength from that. But the front line of your faith is what's going on in your home. The world might not like it when we talk about self-control, and they might not like it when we talk about submission, but they'll find it attractive if they really see it. They might not like anything else we teach, but if they see the Bible lived out daily, a person that's loving and forgiving and kind, they can't help but be attracted to that because an apostolic life is a good life. An apostolic life is a blessed life. An apostolic life is a happy life 
I know we go through trouble. I know we go through trials, but so does everybody else in the world. At least we've got God saying, I'll make it all work together for good to you. So, so we've got a bonus there. And an apostolic life is a good life and a blessed life and a happy life. And if you're not happy living an apostolic life, it's not anything wrong with apostolic. It's something wrong with the way you're doing it. So, so just get to an altar, get in the Bible, talk to somebody, pray a little bit, and get it turned around. Moms of young children, I want to just say one more thing to you about this whole idea of, of keepers at home. Do not let culture define you by what you do or don't do for a career. They're, they're cruel. If you don't have a career, uh, they want to say bad things about you and talk about you like you're inferior or you can't do it. Your greatest contribution, this is a statement that I read uh, uh, several months ago, but I just like this. Your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do. It may be somebody you raise. Do you realize that every great missionary had parents? Every great pastor, every great evangelist, every great person that was used by God, every great saint of God, somewhere there's a godly parent in the background praying for them and teaching them. And your greatest contribution uh, to the kingdom of God, it might not be something that you get to do. It might be somebody you raise up in your home and they do something great for God and that's good too. So this business of being a parent and being a, a mom and a keeper at home, that's important. Now, here's what he says. This is uh, kind of amazing to me because I think it's the same today. Uh, verse 6. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. He's got this long list for everybody else. Uh, aged men, here's 10 things. Aged women, here's 10 things. Uh, young women, here's 10 things. Uh, young men, be disciplined and self-controlled. That's it. That'll be enough. They only receive one word of exhortation because if young men can ever learn to be disciplined... And self-controlled, that just about do it. <clears throat> Let me just let that marinate for a minute. Uh, notice this too, and, and this is how our staff does it, and this is how every good church staff does it. Uh, Titus is told to teach aged men. He's told to teach aged women. Now remember, the church back here is meeting in, in houses and in smaller settings. They're a, a large church in the city, but they meet in all these different places. So he's told to teach aged men and aged women, and he's told to exhort young men. Who's he not told to teach? He's not told to teach young women. That the aged women instruct the younger women. And we do that here. Uh, our pastors, we don't meet alone with ladies and talk to them and uh, because why because uh, we're so weak no because we're so smart to avoid any hint of any impropriety or any immorality or any accusation we don't and and that goes back to the first century Paul said Titus you can teach everybody let the older women teach the younger women I'm not putting you in that situation now Titus job here is to ordain leaders elders in the church but the word elder, it, it means a mature person, in, in particular in scriptural times, a mature man. He's qualified by character. Titus, put people in position of leadership that are qualified by character and qualified by consistency. Character and consistency are more important than age. Not every older man should be permitted to be an elder because he's not being consistent. And by the same token, not every younger man should be prevented from being an elder if he's had good character and if he's been consistent for a number of years. But normally in the church, elders are older. Everybody say elders are older. That's normal in the church because they've lived for God longer. And so in a normal church set situation, uh, the elders are the people that have lived for God a while. So elders typically, they have gray hair and elders typically have a little bit of arthritis kicking in. And elders typically, they've lived for God long enough that they may not have the strength to do what they used to do, but they're elders not because of what they're currently doing. They're elders because of their character and their consistency through their life. And I've said it a thousand times, but it is possible to have people that grow old and never grow up. But when you see somebody that served God faithfully, they've grown old and grown up, and they're worthy of you looking toward them as an elder. And this whole elder thing is important because look at what Paul's doing. This is how a normal church 
runs. This is how apostolic church works. It's the people who are already here that are the model for the people that are coming to God. We can't do this by sticking a pastor up like a prop on Sunday morning behind a pulpit and having him give a little half hour or one hour or two hour talk and have new people just say, oh, okay, that's it. They're looking for somebody to model their life after. People that come to God today are no different than people that came to God then. They don't know how to pray to the true living God. They served idols. So when they come into the church, what are they doing? They're looking around. We're praying. They got one eye open. They're looking around. And when we pray, it's not a time for you to coast as an apostolic church. When we pray, it's time for us to hook on because we want to teach our new believers how to pray and how to get a hold of God. You say, I don't know how to pray. Well, maybe you should fix that. Because we're supposed to be a model for people that are following us. If they want to know how to live, if they want to know how to talk, if they want to know how to dress, if they want to know how to interact with others, if they want to know how to forgive, if they want to know how to be kind or merciful, if they want to watch some friendships develop, they're looking at us because we've already been here for a while. And that's the way it should be in the church. So here's the rule for the apostolic church. If you're young, Find somebody to disciple you. If you're young, if you're young in the church, find somebody to disciple you. Get an elder in your life. If you're old, then you don't stop. Here's your job. Find somebody to disciple. Find a young couple, if you're an older couple, and be kind to them and love on them and invite them out. They would love to sit down. You know, people come and they're not looking for a friendly church when they come. And we are a friendly church, but they're not looking for a friendly church. There's lots of places they can go where people are friendly. Walmart, they're friendly. They hire people to be friendly. So they're not looking for friendly. They're looking for a friend. They're looking for somebody that actually cares about them, takes an interest in them, and, and just, uh, just greeting somebody and being kind and talking about them and their life can do a, a whole lot for them. So if you're young, find somebody to disciple you. If you're old, find somebody to disciple. And for all of us that are in between, do both. <laughs> find somebody to disciple you, and you find somebody to disciple. Because leaders are to be a pattern for other people in everything. Here's what he says. In all things, showing thyself a pattern. Everybody say pattern. A pattern of good works. Here's how you're a pattern of good works. In doctrine, you show uncorruptness. Your doctrine isn't corrupted. You show gravity and sincerity, sound speech, healthy speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Titus is a leader and Titus is a pastor, but please notice, Paul isn't giving him preaching tips. Paul say in Titus, let's talk about being an example, not about being an exhorter, because a leader leads best by who he is, not by what he says all the time. And if he says pray, but he doesn't pray, he's not a good leader. And if he says sacrifice, but he doesn't sacrifice, he's not a worthy leader. And if he says, uh, you know, get involved in church, and he and his family aren't involved in church, he's not a good leader. And so, Titus, it's not about your exhorting, your preaching, it's about your example. And, and so, it's like, Titus, I need you to do this, and then you can say it. But don't say it without doing it. But even though that's true, words are still important. A leader is to use sound speech. Why? So even his enemies can't use his words and twist them against him. That's what he says there. Now he, he's got one more category left. He's done aged men and women, younger men and women. And now he talks to servants or let's call it employees for today. Exhort the employees. How many employees do we have here tonight? Okay, good. This is you. Exhort employees to be obedient under their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of our God, of God our Savior in all things. So employees, here you go. From the Bible, from Paul to you. Be obedient. Everybody say, do what you're asked. If your boss asks you to do something, do it. If it's not illegal, do it. Please them well. Everybody say, do more than you're asked. 
And that's the hard part. They may ask for this, but you be a good employee. Do more than what you're asked. Don't just do the bare minimums. Please them well. Not answering again. Everybody say, don't talk back. Oh, there's the word of the Lord for somebody tonight. You don't argue with your boss. You don't argue. You don't talk back. Not purloining. That means don't steal. Oh, I got that. What about office supplies? They won't miss those. Don't steal. Don't take anything that's not yours. But do you know you can steal from your employee in another, employer in another way? By holding back your best effort. That's stealing. They're paying you to work eight hours and you work four hours and you kind of coast through the other four. That's stealing. That's purloining. Everybody say, do not purloin. Maybe you can put that on your desk tomorrow. We should be employees. We should be servants that have good fidelity. That means consistency. It means our outward actions match our inward convictions. Our outward actions match our inward convictions. That's fidelity. And, and so they don't have to worry that if you've said something to them, it's going to be the truth. Because your outward actions, um, they match your inward convictions. It happened years ago. My dad, of course, was a high school principal for years, and he's here tonight. I remember this because we, uh, we kind of had a laugh about it in the family for years. There was a student who shall remain nameless who was at the high school and gave their uh, gym teacher this long list of reasons why, as a Pentecostal, they could not participate in gym class because it required wearing immodest apparel, and they were a holy Pentecostal. And uh, so... My dad, he got pulled into it, as he usually did for Pentecostal kids of all stripes around town, and he uh, uh, helped them write a letter or whatever happened, and they got excused from gym class until the gym teacher met the student in the Fredericton Mall wearing all the stuff that she said she didn't think was too modest. And the teacher, I remember this, came to my dad and said, you know, your church may have a conviction against certain kinds of clothing, but I have a conviction against lying. And dad promptly agreed and had a come to Jesus meeting with that student, if I remember right. <clears throat> when you get older, you can talk about all these things because they're either dead, gone, moved, or nobody else knows. Um, we're to have good fidelity, folks. Your word is your bond. And if they know you come here and they knew what our, know, know what our church believes, it's a bad testimony for you to, be, to do something here and yet at work you're exactly the opposite. That's a bad testimony. That's not good fidelity. Is this real and practical enough for anybody? And then it says, why would we do that? So that we can adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. The way you live is to beautify, this is the quote I saw in somebody's notes, you should beautify the Bible with the way you live. They might not even believe the Bible, but it should seem beautiful to them when they look at the way you live. You adorn the doctrine, your lifestyle, your actions, your kindness, your honesty, your testimony, it adorns the word of God. So that's what employees are to do. Why do we do this? Uh, is, is it because we're trying to keep a checklist? Why do we do all these things? And why do we uh, have these lists of characteristics for leaders? Is this legalism? Not at all. Here's what Paul says. He said, this is why aged men do this and aged women do this and young women should do this and young men should do this and, and employees should do this. Here's why. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. And the grace of God not the law of God. The grace of God teaches us that we should deny ungodliness and deny worldly lusts and we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Somebody say the grace of God. It's the grace of God that teaches us that. People say, you Pentecostals, you got a big rule book that you have to live by. No, the grace of God teaches us. The fact that God saved us, his grace appeared to us, his grace brought salvation to us, that's why we delight in keeping his laws and his commandments. It's not a bunch of legalism, it's pleasing a God that we're 
that we're in love with. It's not because of anything other than that. And he says, um, you should be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. That's why we give ourselves to him. He gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, purify unto himself a peculiar people who are zealous of good works. They're not resisting good works. They're anxious and zealous and excited to do good works. So you listen to pastor for a second on this matter of grace. Grace is not an excuse for worldliness. Grace is the power to live above sin. When God's grace comes into your life, it lifts you up to a new level of living. And Paul said grace is a teacher. Grace will teach you that you shouldn't go there. Grace will teach you that you shouldn't do that. Grace will teach you that this is the way to please God. And if you listen to the voice of of God's grace. He said Christians are to deny ungodliness. Get out of your life anything that's unlike God. Deny the worldly lusts that cause ungodliness. And instead, live these three ways. Live soberly. That's the attitude you have toward yourself. You're serious about living for God. Live righteously. That's the actions you have toward others. And live godly. That's the actions you have toward God. So in your relationship with yourself and with others and with God, you need to live soberly and righteously and godly because we deny all the things that had us bound. We deny all the things that once had us in sin and in bondage. We reject that and we've given ourselves to God. I wrote this down today. I love it. Christians live in this present world. Paul said, you need to do this in this present world. Live soberly and righteously and godly. We live in this present world, but we do not live like this present world, and we refuse to live for this present world. We are a different people. We've got a different destination, and our God has done so much for us. So literally, our motivation in living for God is twofold. One, it's the hope of heaven. We keep that hope in mind. We keep that soon appearing of Jesus Christ in mind. But an even greater motivation than the coming of the Lord is our love for this Savior who died on a cross to redeem us. His desire is to have a pure, peculiar people who love to do good works. They are zealous to do good works. And if we're not that kind of people, we are disappointing the Savior who redeemed us. He desires to have a pure and peculiar people who are anxious, zealous, excited, pleased, happy to do good works. And so really, your life is like this. Back here in your past, the grace of God has appeared to you. That's when you got your salvation experience. And when the grace of God appeared to you, it started teaching you. And grace will not shut up. Grace will not stop. People think grace is some kind of, you know, like easy believism. Grace is tough because grace will say, that was the law in the Old Testament, but I expect better of you. You've got my spirit in you. I cleansed your sins with my blood. You've got my word to guide you. And so grace actually expects us to live this. And so the Old Testament, that's this level of living. But the New Testament, because we've got God's grace, it's God's power in us to live above sin. We don't need a rule book. We just need his book. We don't need a policeman. We've got the Holy Ghost in us. And if we've got the Holy Spirit and we're trying to please a holy God and we're living by a holy Bible, we're going to live godly, holy, righteous lives. And so that's what he says. You're the first appearing that he talks about is in verse 11 of chapter 2. The grace of God has appeared. But the second appearing that we're concerned about, the glory of God's going to appear. Jesus is coming back. And so all of us right now, we're living in between. Verse 11 is behind us and verse 13 is in front of us. We are pushed by the grace of God to live this. And we are pulled by the glory of God that's coming to live this. And so we live our lives in light of both of those appearings. The reason I live like I live is because grace 
did appear for me and Jesus is going to appear for me. And so I'm living in between those two tensions. I'm grateful for the grace of God, but I'm anxious for the coming of the Lord. And so I'm pulled and pushed at the same time. And so my motivation is not a rule book. My motivation is grace lifted me and saved me and redeemed me and changed me. So grace pushes me. But Jesus is coming. And when he comes, sin's gone and the devil's defeated. And so his second coming, the glory of God, that's pulling me. So that's my tension that I live with. Oh, somebody lift up your hands and just worship God for a second if you would. Grace is not some cheap version of the Old Testament. Grace is the power behind the New Testament in the church of the living God. I thank God for the grace of God that appeared to me and I thank God for the glory of God that I'm headed for. Somebody said, well, that's legalism. No, that's not legalism. Paul would say, God forbid. <laughs> in the Greek, don't be so stupid. I know that's in there. I'm looking for it. Legalism says what we do, our list of rules, what we do leads us to who we are. So if you do enough rules and if you keep enough stuff, then that'll make you worthy or godly or righteous. So that's legalism. What you do leads you to who you are. That's not what we are. We are people of grace and grace teaches us who you are leads you to what you do. It's very different. See, legalism says you got to do this, and then if you do enough of this, then you can be this. Grace turns that on its head. Grace says you're already a child of God, so live worthy of it. You're already saved from sin, so don't go back to sin. You're already lifted up to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so why would you go and wallow around in the things of the world? See, it's exactly backwards. It's not that what we do makes us what we are. It's that who we are helps us do what we should do. I am a child of God. Amen. Mm. Now, grace does not say what you do doesn't matter. That's false, cheap grace. Grace says what you do matters, but you do it because of who you are. It's totally different than legalism. So, so Paul says, Titus, I want you to speak these things. I want you to exhort. And sometimes when you exhort, that's the positive. You need to rebuke. If somebody's not doing this, not living this, you need to rebuke. That's the negative part of exhorting. And you need to do it with all authority. Paul's always telling Timothy and Titus, these young pastors, he's saying, use authority. Stand up, get some backbone, and, and preach it. Don't let anybody intimidate you. Speak it with authority. Let no man despise you. So Titus, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put them in mind, remind them, to be subject, to be submitted to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates. Somebody say, keep the law. That's a good idea for Christians. Be ready to every good work. Speak evil of no man. Don't be brawlers. Be gentle. Show meekness to all men. That's what he says. Now think about this. This is the Roman Empire. They've got Caesars that haul people into jails and behead them and, and crucify them and put them in arenas because they're Christians. And in the brutal Roman Empire, Paul says, Titus, tell the people to be good citizens. Now that's a stretch. That you're going to be a good, faithful, loyal citizen in the brutal, corrupt, sin-sick Roman Empire. And yet that's what the church did. In the early church, it's amazing if you read some of the documents, some of the letters that were written between government officials in Roman times, a few have survived, a handful have survived, and invariably this is what they say. I'm paraphrasing wildly as you can imagine. These Christians are crazy. They have weird doctrines and they have weird rituals and they do all of this crazy stuff, but their lifestyle, they love their wives they love their children. They love each other. They are the best citizens we have in the Roman Empire. Invariably, that's what they say. They don't even agree with the Christians. They're trying to persecute the Christians because of their doctrine. But yet, they look at the Christians and say, but their lifestyle. And if that's not us, we need to take a little bit of a checkup and make sure. I I'm not talking about uh, your dress code, by the way. I know the world thinks that's kind of strange. I'm talking about how you live. They'll overlook a lot of your doctrine 
And, and they'll, they'll, they'll just kind of give you a rain check on that and you may get a chance to share your doctrine later. And you may get a chance to talk to them about the Holy Ghost later. But if you just live this in front of them, it worked in the first century under the Roman Empire. Now, if they could be good citizens and if they were told to be good citizens in Roman times, how much more should we be good citizens in Canada? So pay your taxes, don't cheat the government, you know, do all the good stuff. Somebody said amen. That was a weak amen. Did somebody get messed up by the election or what? Be good citizens. Somebody say amen. If you're not a good citizen, you're not a good testimony. You might, you might be saved, but you're sure not a good testimony to anybody about it. Paul tells us, don't be critical. Speak evil of no man. Uh, don't fight with them. Be gentle. Show meekness toward them. Don't be critical of all your unsaved neighbors. Because there was a time... Not too long ago for any of us that we were exactly like them. Before the grace of God came into our lives, you were that. You did that. You acted like that. So don't you get all up on your high horse, I'm a Christian, and give them some snotty, arrogant attitude. You come down and be humble toward them because if it wasn't for the grace of God, you'd be exactly like that because you used to be like that. Amen. He says this, we ourselves, look at it, we also were sometimes foolish. We were just like them. We were disobedient and deceived and we served divers' lusts and pleasures. We were just like them. We lived in malice and envy. We were hateful. We hated one another. We were just exactly like them. So what happened? Here's what happened. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, it wasn't by works of righteousness which we have done. It was according to his mercy that he saved us. If God had been waiting for a checklist to be filled out, none of us would have ever made it. None of us would ever be here. But thank God he wasn't looking for a checklist. Thank God what he was looking for was a people to show mercy to. According to his mercy, he saved us. This is cool. By the washing of regeneration. What do you think that is? It literally means the bath of baptism. That's what it is. When you were baptized in Jesus' name, you did, get, you did more than, you, than getting wet. That was the, the washing or the bath of regeneration. By the washing of regeneration and by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So there's baptism in Jesus' name and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for those experiences. And he shed this on us, his mercy. He shed it on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That being justified, here it is, by his grace, not by works, not by our own effort, but by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It was God's kindness toward us that got us here. It was God's love toward us that got us here. Paul, all through this epistle, he keeps saying, do good works, maintain good works, do good works, maintain good works. But it's not because the good works save us. It's because we've been saved. So do good works, maintain good works, do good works, maintain good works. It's not to get saved. It's because you are saved. Our good works, anything good we ever do is not to merit some kind of brownie point system. Anything good we ever do is just thankfulness for the mercy of God that he gave to us. In verse 8 he said, this is a faithful saying and I want you to affirm these things constantly. Keep telling people that they're not saved by works but they need to do good works. They didn't get here on their own but now that they're here they need to do something out of thanks to God. Just keep affirming that and he keeps talking about that. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works because these things are good and profitable unto men. Church leaders especially, all Christians should maintain good works. There are always going to be people, just settle it in your mind, they're going to disagree with the discipline that's necessary to be a disciple. They're going to disagree. They're going to have arguments. They're going to pick a fight with you. And Paul says, you know what? There's going to be people that don't like the way you live, but just avoid all those arguments entirely. Here's why. People that are always picking a fight about some little area of Bible doctrine, that's because they usually have a major area of Bible doctrine that's not right in their life. There are people that will argue over everything. There are people that will fight about the end times. There are people that will fight. I mean fight. 
You know, uh, they'll kill each other and then neither one of them are going to go in the rapture whenever it happens. And Paul said, people that are fighting about little minor areas of Bible doctrine, typically they've got something wrong. So here's what you do with those people. Um, you know what? Just here's, here's what you do, Titus. Avoid them. Avoid foolish questions. Avoid genealogies. Avoid contentions. Avoid strivings about the law. All of those things are unprofitable and vain. If you're fighting about it, it's not worth having the fight. Uh, the Bible's not a good book to fight about. It tells us not to fight and strive and war. and so, so, so it's not worth it. And if it's somebody that's picking a fight with you, you're better if you just show kindness and mercy and love and you just excuse yourself from the argument because arguments about the Bible usually don't get won. The way Titus is being taught here, Paul says, Titus, pick people that have got character. Don't pick people that can win a fight. Don't pick people that can argue somebody into a corner on the finer details of eschatology or soteriology. There, I know big words. Don't pick people like that. Pick people that have character and they'll live this in front of somebody. And by living it in front of somebody, that's how we impact them. So that's what you need to do. Now, there does come a point when somebody is causing division in the church when we need to step it up a notch. And here it is. Uh, this is a, an important word here. Uh, but a man that is an heretic, everybody say heretic. A heretic after the first and second admonition reject him, knowing that he is such as, he that is such is, he subverted, he sinneth, he's condemned of himself. So there's one exception to this don't argue rule. There's one exception. And you'll probably never have to deal with it unless you're a pastor, but if you're a pastor, you might. A heretic is literally, today we think a heretic is somebody that believes a false doctrine. Uh, that's part of it. But a heretic, literally, the word in the Greek is one who causes division. That's a heretic. A heretic uh, causes division, division, two visions. The church is going this way, but they're campaigning for this way. The pastor's teaching this, but they're campaigning for this. Uh, the body's unified around this, but they want to go over here and do this. So this is somebody, a heretic, literally, biblically, in the Greek language, is somebody that tries to get a little following by going from person to person, trying to force others to choose, die vision, to choose a different side. That's a heretic. And so we're very clear here. Warn them twice, and the third time, if they won't listen, get rid of them, disfellowship them. That's scripture. And, and you know what? If the unity of the church is at issue, that's a scripture that we have to live by. We cannot have people that tear up the precious saints of God and tear up the unity of the church. And I feel really free to talk about that tonight because I don't believe we have any of that here and I'm so grateful for it. There are churches that have one issue and one problem after another after another, and a lot of the times it's because one person won't shut their mouth and they're constantly causing division and they're constantly gossiping and backbiting, and a lot of times it's young pastors like Titus and they're afraid to deal with it. Paul said, Titus, use your authority. Don't let anybody despise you, and if they won't listen and if they keep causing division, uh, rebuke them twice and the third time, out the door. Somebody say amen. <laughs> you say, that's tough. Yeah, it is. Because the church is precious. That's why it's tough. Why would we do that? Why would we ask somebody, don't come back? Because Paul says they're subverted. They're warped in their character. They won't stop sinning. You say, but we couldn't condemn them. It's not the church that has condemned them. They have condemned themselves. But that's too authoritarian. That, I don't know what Paul's talking about, but it can't be that because that's too authoritarian. No, it's exactly what Jesus taught his disciples to do. Matthew chapter 18. He said, if your brother trespasses against you, go and talk to him alone. Don't go to the phone. Please don't go to Facebook. Go talk to him alone. And, and, and if you can make some progress, if he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he won't hear you, Still don't go to Facebook. <laughs> That's in the Greek. I know it. I know it's in the Greek. If he won't hear you, then take one or two more. So go to him with another couple of people so you can bring some brothers or sisters and, and you can try to deal with it. 
and, and, and take them that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Sometimes when it's just you and them talking, things get twisted and you said this and you say, no, I didn't, but there was nobody else. So, so Jesus said, if, if it doesn't work the first time, take somebody else with you and go try again. And if that doesn't work, still don't put it on Facebook. If he neglects to hear you, and if he neglects to hear them, tell it unto the church. That's where the pastor gets involved, the church gets involved, and they admonish somebody because they're damaging the church. And he says, if he neglects, this is Jesus, if he neglects to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Now they knew what that was. Heathen men and publicans, the Jews had nothing to do with. And Jesus said, it would be like what the Jews do with heathens and publicans. You just need to cut your ties. Do you know sometimes there are people that you just have to cut ties with? And this may happen to you. I hope it doesn't. But if somebody is constantly tearing down your relationship with God, tearing down the saints of God, tearing down the church of God, you may have to put some distance between you and them because your life for God and your church are too important to you. And Paul closes his epistle with personal greetings, like he always does. And he can't resist. Uh, in, in verse 14, he says, uh, be careful to maintain good works. He says it one more time. You know, you, you gotta, this is what he's writing to Titus. And he wants to send a couple of guys, Artemis or Tychicus. He's going to send them to Crete to look after the church so Titus can come visit him because he's wanting to see Titus. He's a mentor to him. He mentions a guy named Zenos the lawyer. We don't know who he is, but he does mention a guy named Apollos. Apollos was an eloquent evangelist. You might remember him from 1 Corinthians. Apollos was this eloquent, powerful preacher, and he toured around, and he went to churches, and he preached, and he ministered, and he strengthened churches. And there was a little kind of an issue that arose in the New Testament church. You see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. People started saying, well, I'm of Paul. And people started saying, well, I'm of Apollos. Paul's my favorite preacher. Apollos is my favorite preacher. And they started comparing back and forth and choosing camps. And they became very loyal to one or the other. And Apollos really became a preacher, not by his fault, but he just became a preacher that was constantly being compared to Paul. And he was exalted above Paul by many people. This had to be something that Paul noticed. People in the churches that he had witnessed to, that he had discipled, that he had pastored, he had started the church, and now there's people in the church that he started that are saying, I like Apollos better than Paul. I, I, I'm of the Apollos camp. I, I don't have anything to do with Paul. Apollos is better than Paul. And we don't know that Apollos ever encouraged that. I don't think he did. But it was going on in the church. And with all of that going on, it would have been very possible for Paul to get a little bit of envy or bitterness in his spirit. It's hard sometimes to see somebody else exalted. And Paul could have been like that. He could have felt competitive toward Apollos. He could have even been bitter toward him. After all, he started those churches. Apollos is just kind of an itinerant preacher. He goes around and preaches, but he has good sermons. Paul, he's kind of a writer. You know, like we don't have any epistles from Apollos today, so I think Paul won out in the end. But at the time, Paul could have said, you know, who does he think he is? Watch what he says. It's amazing. Chapter 3, verse 12. He's winding up his epistle. When I send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me, to Nicopolis. I, I, I'm going to winter there. I, I want you to come visit me. Bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos. Watch what he says to Titus. Titus is his, his young protege. Paul mentored him. So Titus is going to do exactly what his elder says. I want you to bring Zenos and Apollos on their journey diligently. Be very diligent to help them and to bring them on their journey. And Titus, don't let anything be wanting unto them. Make their job, make their life, make their ministry, make their journey easy. That's quite amazing. Paul didn't see Apollos as a rival. He didn't see him as a competitor. Uh, he doesn't want anything but unity in the apostolic church. And division and competition and envy and jealousy should not be part of the apostolic church. Ever, ever, ever. Uh, earlier, Paul mentioned in this chapter malice and envy. He said, 
You know, we used to be like the sinners. We used to have malice and envy. Malice is wanting somebody, something bad to happen to somebody. You hate them so bad. I want something bad to happen to them. That's malice. Envy is not wanting something good to happen to somebody. I don't want them to get the promotion. I don't want them to have that. I don't want them. And malice and envy don't have any part in the apostolic church. And Paul didn't have that in his spirit. He said, Titus, I want you to make their life easy. I want you to help them. I, I, I want you to, to do everything you can so nothing is wanting unto them. And then he says it again. This is his close for the epistle. And let ours also, the saints that we're mentoring, the people we're training, the leaders we're raising up, let them learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. You're unfruitful if you don't have good works in your life. He says, all that are with me salute you and, and greet them that love us in the faith. And grace be with you all. He says, all that are with me salute you, Titus, because Paul is constantly, his life, constantly intertwined with this little entourage. Uh, he, he's always got somebody around him that he's doing life with. Uh, he's always, even when he's in prison, he's always associating with young leaders. He's always trying to mentor people. He's always trying to disciple people. And he's the guy that gets kicked in and out of prison at the end of his life. And that's what we see in the book of Titus. More than anything else, probably. Discipleship, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Discipleship is to take place in a community of believers. Not just one at a time but a person coming into a family, a person coming into a community. That's discipleship. It's to take place in a community where the younger ones can look at the older ones and the new ones can look at the established ones. It's to take place in a community where we love each other and we protect unity and we protect each other. That's the community of believers. And it's to involve every generation, aged, younger, aged, younger, employees, masters. It's to involve, every, it's to involve everybody. Because good disciples make good disciples. Paul says this in another book that he writes, 1 Thessalonians. He said, we were affectionately desirous of you. We were so affectionate toward you. We were willing to have imparted unto you. Watch what Paul says here. We didn't just impart to you the gospel. We didn't just give you Acts 2.38. We just didn't give you John 3.16. We didn't just give you some scriptures and principles. We didn't just impart to you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. And I think that's the summary of what Paul's telling Titus as well. It's not just about giving somebody a list of doctrines to believe. It's not just about welcoming somebody to services. It's about literally inviting people into our lives so we know them and we love them, and we fellowship with them, and we do life together. And I, I, I'm finished, but I would just say this to us as a church family. Um, in the last few weeks, we've had several new families that have just kind of landed here. Our friend day was a, a wonderful outreach, and we're still seeing people come. There were people in the building tonight because they came first on friend day. But those new believers, those new babies, they won't survive if all they've got is a couple of pastors that love them. They need a family of God that loves them. They need a family of God that cares for them. They, they need a family of God that takes an interest in them. Paul said, I didn't just give you the gospel. You know, we rejoice when somebody gets baptized. We rejoice when somebody gets the Holy Ghost. We rejoice when somebody comes to the altar. We, but we're not here to just give them the gospel. We're here to give them our own selves also. And that's how Paul did it. Paul was the greatest apostle of the New Testament. Paul said, I didn't just give you the gospel. I gave you myself. And that's what God's calling each of us to be. Because good disciples make good disciples. So not to put too practical or personal a spin on it, but who is it that you're investing yourself in their life other than your family and your friends, you know, the people you've hung out with in Pentecost for 50 years, who is it that you were investing in? Because a good disciple will be making good disciples. Who is it that you know? Who is it that you've met? Who is it you've become a friend with? Who is it you've talked to? Who is it you've prayed for? 
Because all of our precious babies that are coming along to this church, they don't just need a pastor to stand in the pulpit or a pastor to talk to them in the lobby. They're looking for people that are living this life in the same situations they're living. Somebody that has a job that's not so great. Somebody that has a, a, a spouse that isn't serving God. Somebody that lives in a neighborhood where there's uh, crime or where there's some violence or where there's, uh, you know, some, some sadness or where there's some trouble or, or where somebody that has a teen that struggled and they have a teen that struggled. Everything that we are, everything that we've gone through, God can use that to help somebody else do this. And some of us have walked through the fire and the flood and God's not going to waste that. God's going to use that so somebody else can be discipled because good disciples make good disciples. Would you lift your hands? I, I do feel the conviction of the Lord on that point. I, I wish you'd lift your hands and, and pray with me before we go tonight. I wish you'd lift your voice and pray with me, church. God, I thank you for a wonderful church family. I thank you, God, for precious saints. Thank you for faithful elders. Thank you for our young couples and thank you, God, for our single parents and our single adults that are living this and learning this and doing this. And I thank you for them. Jesus, would you help us to get the heart that Paul had where we're not just looking to give them the gospel like a sales pitch, but we're actually looking to give our own lives to them and for them. We're not just looking to present them with a list of doctrines, but we're looking to actually get involved to be a help to be a friend, Lord Jesus, to pray and to serve and to do life together, all so they can be discipled, all so they can be matured, all so they can be reached, all so they can be saved. Jesus, I pray you'd help us and, 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 and teach us, and God, if necessary, convict us on this point that it's not just enough to introduce people to doctrine. We've got to introduce them to ourselves, and then they can follow us as we follow you. Jesus, would you use our church for that? Would you use us to continue impacting a city and a province that really doesn't know you? God, I pray for some senior saints that are here tonight. They think their time of service is just about done. But God, there's nobody that can come alongside a young believer like a seasoned saint and hug them and love them and pray for them and be an example to them. There's nobody can do that any better. God, I pray across the ages of our multi-generational church, you'd help us do this well, and you'd help us do it in a Bible way that we give ourselves to them, and then we can give the gospel to them. I pray you'd let your word settle deep. I pray you'd let your word convict. I pray you'd let your word instruct. Teach me, Jesus, to do this. Teach us, Jesus, to do this. God, your grace that has appeared to us is motivation enough for us to want to share this with somebody else. I pray your blessing on the precious people of God. I ask you to use us this week, God, so others can be reached and others can be saved. And we'll give you all the thanks and we'll give you all the glory because we pray it in Jesus' name. I appreciate you praying, but I wish you'd end by just lifting your hands and worshiping God, just giving praise and thanks. I'm glad you were in Bible study, but I'm glad Jesus is here and I'm glad we're gathered around his word. Jesus, touch us tonight. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your grace. It's all the motivation we need. We don't need you to do more, so we're motivated. We, we, you've already done more than we could ever ask, more than we could ever expect. Thank you for your grace. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray.